Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm Victoria de Grazia, and I, I direct the Blinken European Institute, and I simply wanted to say a few words as to how this fits uh, into our programs and how it, it might uh, continue to engage you. Uh, we, we've set ourselves as one of our interest uh, building a, a series on public diplomacy, new diplomacy, uh, however you, you, know, you, you want to uh, define it. And in that framework, we've, we, some of us have taught historical courses uh, with the journalism school, history journalism, uh, and we're continuing this sort of outreach to the schools of practice. And the, 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 under that guise, we've worked, uh, we've been working with Catherine, uh, with Victoria Phillips, who's in the history department. Uh, now, uh, Anya uh, Schifrin is here uh, from uh, SIPA, and we're continuing to work in this direction. So over the last year and a half or so, we've conducted undergraduate uh, uh, research work with West Point uh, students and their professors, and we've been continuing to uh, keep uh, th that, that open. Very, 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 very fruitful conversations uh, and, and actual research work. Uh, last November, uh, Catherine uh, helped, uh, and I should say more than helped, organize uh, a, a roundtable on public broadcasting, somewhat similar to this, bringing in BBC, France uh, uh, 24, and the Voice of America. Uh, to discuss really rather different approaches. Uh, 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 la this last March, uh, Victoria Phillips is here. <laughs> I got without glasses, nice, <laughs> slightly different. Uh, uh, organized a, a, uh, get a, a series, uh, a round table on philanthropy and public diplomacy, bringing in Open Society, Rockefeller, uh, uh, and also uh, the, Deutsche Bank, I'm not sure I wasn't here, uh, and also, some, again, the work of Army uh, Defense uh, in uh, Iraq. Uh, and next uh, fall, we'll be looking forward uh, to an uh, event, uh, again, organized by Victoria Phillips, um, uh, dealing with uh, arts foundations. We're also very interested in a broader project that would include our European colleagues, it's the European Institute, so, you know, trying to tie together Europe, America, but also in terms of a broader view, and for that reason, we've been working with the Norwegian Nobel Committee in the University of Oslo. Uh, a student of the university will be here next year. Um, so let me turn over, the, keep, keep your eyes on this. I hope you'll uh, engage, bring in your ideas, and now let me turn it over to Catherine. Hi everyone, I'm Katherine Brown. I'm based in the Journalism School and I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to our mo about our moderator and our panel speakers and pass it over to them. Um, we're very lucky today to have um, Professor Anya Schifrin as our moderator. She is the Director of SEPA's International Media Advocacy and Communication Specialization and she is going to be uh, moderating a conversation between Richard Boley, um, Taylor Owen, and Ivan Segal. And Richard Bully is a career U.S. Uh, diplomat and is the director of the Office of E-Diplomacy. Um, Ivan Segal is the executive director of Global Voices and has spent the last 15 to 20 years designing media programs in, um, in more than 30 countries. And then Taylor Owen is the research director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at the Columbia Journalism School. He's also the founding editor-in-chief of the Canadian International Council's International Affairs Platform, OpenCanada.org. And we're thrilled to have you all with us. Thank you so much, Professor Schifrin. Great. Well, we, um, we talked amongst ourselves to, to plan the day, and um, I think that we came to the conclusion that Richard Bowley would present first, right? Do you, are you all set up for your? Yep, already. Great, so why don't you start by okay. talking to us a little bit about what the State Department's doing internally. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anya. I did want to thank the Blinken European Institute, uh, Anya Schifrin and uh, Sipa for this opportunity, and thank you for coming out and, uh, and participating. Uh, what I really want to do, and this is the important part, so this is the part that if you're texting or if you're checking emails if you, and you miss it, you'll then wonder two minutes from now what the heck we're talking about. So <laughs> the part where you talk about your assumptions. So I'm going to move from a point, the assumption being that an organization that embraces a culture of connection, openness, and collaboration internally is more credibly able to promote that kind of culture externally. 
Uh, so think of the chef who doesn't eat in his own restaurant. He's less credible, right? Uh, so that's, that's my kind of point of departure because I'm gonna talk a lot about what the State Department has done to become internally, internally more social, to become a social enterprise instead of a siloed enterprise. So how can information be exchanged internally? So has everybody got that? At least do you agree with that, uh, that premise? I think we or, need you to come to Columbia, Richard, and uh, uh, introduce some of these concepts yes. to our, our, our campus. It, it, no, it's, it, it is a, it, it's a problem. Um, and we, you know, later in the conversation, we can talk a little about how big organizations have tried to tackle this. Sometimes, like the, the company uh, Gore Industries, which makes Gore-Tex, any unit that gets bigger than 150 people, they cut it in half, saying you can't collaborate if you've got more than 150 people. We don't have that option in government, but. Um. So uh, I'll, I'll jump into my presentation and I'm gonna try to really be, uh, you know, be, you know, not dwell on too much and get as quickly as we can to the conversation. So if something's not clear, remember we can come back to it in the conversation. Um, so again, the, the thing I wanted to, to kind of really focus on is uh, the State Department is probably the most unlikely uh, organization to be an innovator in the idea of internal collaboration using social software. Um, you know, we are the oldest federal agency. Uh, we're risk averse by design. Uh, when they hire diplomats, the testing is kind of meant to, to kind of filter out the people who are risk takers. So, um, you know, think back a couple hundred years ago, uh, maybe 150 years ago, uh, when diplomats were, were communicating, their mode of communication official were, were wax sealed diplomatic notes between embassies and uh, you know, foreign ministries, foreign offices, and back and forth. So very slow, tedious, cumbersome process. Uh, then the disruptive technology of the day emerged, the telegraph, and diplomats continued to move at the speed of wax sealed diplomatic notes uh, while tensions and wars moved at the speed of electrons, the results were not pretty. So fast forward 100 and plus years, um, you know, maybe while you or maybe your parents or your older siblings were geeking out over their Bondi Blue iMac, you know, had the State Department learned from earlier lessons? No, we were keeping this company called Wang Computers, which was in chapter 11, on life support. Uh, because we had such a large installed base and we were slow, so slow to move off of uh, Wang to uh, you know, a PC platform. So what was it that allowed us to make this kind of huge wrenching transformational change? Uh, our tipping point were three dramatic failures. The East Africa Embassy bombings, 9-11, and a just a, an awful kludgy uh, effort at knowledge management which failed miserably. So 10 years ago, then Secretary of State Colin Powell said, let's create an office that puts end users in the IT decision making process and see if we can figure out a way to answer the big challenge, which is how does a large organization know what it knows? If somebody in one part knows something that's critical to somebody else, how do you increase the probability that those two people uh, and those ideas can find each other. So I'm gonna run through, these are some tools that we've evolved over time uh, to, to hopefully, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of uh, opening up the curtain so you get to see behind our firewall the kinds of tools that we've developed to try to address this, this challenge of all large organizations, uh, which is, you know, if, if, the, if uh, one person knows this information and another needs it, how do they find each other? Um, I think it was Lou Platt, who was the then CEO of Hewlett Packard many years ago, said, if Hewlett Packard only knew what Hewlett Packard knows, we'd be three times more profitable. Um, you know, that's kind of the same challenge we were tackling. They went after, Hewlett Packard did this hierarchical approach uh, like the one that we, that we failed at. They spent half a billion dollars before they pulled the plug on it. Um, we fortunately spent a lot less. Uh, and, and fortunately also our office, the Office of E-Diplomacy, didn't have much of a budget. So rather than looking at these mega solutions, we went with 
small tools that we're using open source software and were pretty easy for us to manage internally. So the first is a simple wiki. I mean, you all know uh, Wikipedia. We have Diplopedia inside the State Department. So again, think of this hierarchical command and control organization where if a you know, formal message, these, these wax sealed diplomatic notes and cables, uh, they're called cables because they used to be sent across transoceanic cables, uh, these messages you know, are, are authoritative and are signed either by the Secretary of State or the Ambassador. So again, very hierarchical. We then set up this wiki that anybody, the newest newbie, could go in and put up an article or edit one of the 17,000 articles that are there. Um, and their wikis are great for a lot of things, and uh, I'll give you at least one example of how we've, how we've used them. Um, the, the, the kind of uh, critical gatekeeper for a relationship between an embassy, uh, you know, foreign embassy in the US and our embassy to that country overseas is the desk officer, so the country desk officer. Really is kind of like a traffic cop. Um, doesn't make policy, but just tries to make sure that all the right information gets to the right people at the right time. Um, but those jobs are oftentimes the first jobs people have, a diplomat has when they come back to Washington after two tours overseas. So they really are still trying to figure their way around the whole um, building uh, at the State Department and yet they have to know how to do a lot of different things. And since everybody's turning over every two years, you may not have any institutional memory in your office. So we helped uh, develop this Deskopedia. Deskopedia is kind of the place where you go when you first hit a challenge that you don't know how to do uh, and, and you find your guidance. And if that guidance turns out to be wrong, you, because it's the wiki, can update it. So again, evolving persistent knowledge. I'm going to jump to another example, which are very simple kind of multi-author blogs. So think of Diplopedia and a wiki as kind of evolving persistent knowledge, not something you have a conversation about, but something that you want to be able to change, uh, but really it's not conversational. Blogs are much more conversational. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things they can, they can replace uh, and things that they're good for. So again, give you one example. Uh, the social media hub at the State Department is, helps people who do social media at the State Department um, understand what are the best practices. So, you know, how do you use Pinterest in a way that's meaningful, you know, to embassy officers? You know, what's the guidance? What are the best practices for using social media, not as a citizen, but as a representative of the government? So again, how to do it smart, how to use it well, uh, what are other people doing? It's a place to share information. We also have, we have more, more than 75 of these multi-author blogs, uh, everything from Iran watchers, the impact of, uh, Af of China and Africa to people who bike to work, you know, uh, people who are where both, member, both spouses are members of the State Department, they have to manage a, you know, a, a difficult career and family life. So, uh, ideation, so we, we also have a, uh, it's called the Secretary's Sounding Board where you can turn water cooler conversation into action. Uh, things that before would have, would have died after a conversation uh, were able to be, you know, to be brought to fruition. Again, some very simple uh, examples, but, uh, Somebody said, look, if, if we could only put a uh, bicycle, uh, a shower next to the bicycle racks, more people would bike to work. You know, pretty simple. Because before then, you had to walk in your, you know, tight bike shorts through the State Department to the shower, walking, saying hi to assistant secretaries and undersecretaries. And uh, once, so, so we actually, the person who could uh, make that happen found the person with the idea, they, they uh, implemented it, and you know, it's a big greening initiative. We've got more than, uh, uh, you know, more than double the number of people who bike to, to the State Department. Uh, one thing about, and this has been a challenge, frankly, with our sounding board is uh, it's got to be credible. People have to believe that somebody who's a decision maker is listening and cares. So. Uh, internal networking platform, so think of LinkedIn. Uh, we've developed a LinkedIn inside the State Department, really answering that question of how do you find expertise. <laughs> So I can cre I create my own profile, I show the languages that I speak, I show the places that I've worked, I, I can point to the work that I've done, so there's a kind of a credible, you know, I can credibly um, indicate that I've got expertise and other people can then uh, validate that. Uh, it's kind of the, you know, it's a much more social way of finding uh, expertise and finding answers on the fly. You're working on a project, nobody who you know can solve it or has ever worked on anything like that. You can reach out to people you don't know and identify their expertise and bring them in as, as uh, kind of virtual collaborators. 
Um, so this is what it looks like. It's called Corridor. We built it on open source software, BuddyPress. Uh, we've got about 13,000 users uh, and about 650 groups that uh, people have uh, created on the fly. And this integrates in really well with our next uh, product. This is our, our most recent product, uh, which is kind of like a uh, NetVibes or Google Reader. So it allows you to take uh, again, and it, it answers the challenge. Uh, Clay Shirky, um, who's a big kind of thinker on, on the use of social software and, and the social web, said, look, we don't have information overload. What we have is a filter failure. Uh, you want all the information that you need. You just want to exclude all the information you don't want. So right, you don't want, to, you don't want less information. You want the right information. And we think this is kind of the answer to that. Um, and from the screenshots, it's kind of hard to see. But I curated this page for uh, you know, innovation and design thinking. So you can, anybody who's interested in that can follow this page that I've created. Uh, and you know, they can see all the, the sites that I've uh, identified. Um, and it's easy to share the page. It's hard to see in the lower right-hand cor corner. But I can share that page with anybody else. So they don't have to create their own page. And then when I edit my page, they get the edits automatically. Uh, so it's a way to, again, share. Uh, knowledge. Um, the other uh, great thing is you can build your filter. So you can filter for those sites for different words. So maybe today you really care, or yesterday you really cared about Benghazi, today you really care about North Korea, you go in really quickly and just change your filter. So from your feeds, you're getting what you're looking for. Um, and the, the really great thing is um, that you can then share these on Corridor. Once you find an artifact, you, instead of emailing the link to somebody, you share uh, on Corridor, that professional networking platform, maybe within a group that you know really care about this issue, and you can wrap a conversation around it. The other thing is that this is not just for external feeds, it's for external and internal feeds. Uh, so soon we'll be able to do this with cables themselves, which historically have been pretty sterile documents. There's not a conversation wrapped around them. Uh, this will have roles-based access and uh, be able to wrap a conversation around it. Um, we also have a, a, this is a little more working externally, but how do we reach, to, reach out to brilliant people like you and help us solve problems? Uh, we have a, a program called the Virtual Student Foreign Service Microtasking Platform. Um, do any, have you, any of you heard of Mechanical Turk? Um, well, it's a, it, it, basically it allows kind of discrete tasks to be put out, anybody who's part of that community can jump in and say, hey, I can do that. Uh, so instead of playing Farmville or Mafia Wars, or uh, you can actually you know, be saving the world. So uh, it, we're excited about this. We've done the, the, uh, you know, the, the early testing in it and uh, haven't scaled it out yet. Uh, so that's it in a nutshell. So really what I wanted to do is provide a sense of what we've done um, and how that then allows us to be credible when you look at internet freedom, which is actually the same kind of approach to the internet. So if we're not living this internally, um, it, it, you know, form doesn't follow function and, and we don't, um, we're not credible advocates of this on the outside. So look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, Digital diplomacy and e-government is something we're starting to think more and more about at SEPA, as we should be. And we're very lucky because we have Alexis Wachowski from, from your office who's been teaching for us. And I think I see in the audience some of our students who've been advising some governments overseas on some of this. So I think that um, your talk is actually very relevant for a lot of our preoccupations. And I know also at Columbia, they've been talking about what kinds of sort of sharing websites can be developed. And the president's office has people working on this right now. I actually saw a very interesting sort of UNDP version of Facebook recently. I don't know how many of you have seen that, which allows a lot of sort of interdepartmental collaboration. So I thought that that was very helpful um, for beginning to this discussion. I'm very excited to have Ivan Segal here. Um, I, I, everyone knows Global Voices and the fantastic work that you do. Um, and I'm giving you the difficult task, but I know you're more than up to it, of taking some of this and giving us the sort of bigger picture of how, of what's going on with the internet freedom agenda around the world. So thank you very much, Ivan. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for attending. I'll try to keep my remarks uh, pretty quick, pretty short, so that we can have a conversation. Um, so, so, Richard, I, I agree with you that congruence is really important. Mm -hmm. Internal and external openness 
It's a great idea. And um, I think to give state some kudos, there are definitely people in state and, and some projects as part of the um, internet freedom agenda who have been thinking pretty seriously about um, about what it takes to offer some tools and tactics and knowledge about how to build and provide resources for um, activists, for people in repressive environments, for other others to have the, the ability to communicate and to share knowledge and to operate anonymously and with a degree of privacy. Um, and for those of you who don't know uh, the topic especially well, I'd recommend you go, go and look at Hillary Clinton's two major policy speeches on the topic. I'm not going to reprise them today, but there's a, a lot of data and a lot of conversation and a lot of articles that's been written, a lot of articles that have been written about this topic, what works and what doesn't. I'll just tell you very briefly what the U.S. government and especially the State Department has been doing in the past four years on this topic. They've spent roughly, I think, $90 million now, between 10 and $25 million a year on tools, circumvention tools, anonymity tools, um, anti-surveillance tools, and supporting the, their, knowledge, their dissemination and their use in certain countries and parts of the world where governments are repressive or are very involved in surveillance and censorship of their citizens. That approach is quite useful for those communities and those individuals. However, it's very important to know that it's a tactic. And it's a tactic because the larger US government position on the question of openness in the internet is very convoluted. And essentially, I would say the biggest, if I can drill down to, in a nutshell, using a little bit of hyperbole, the biggest enemy to the D Department of State's internet freedom policy is the Department of Treasury and the Department of Commerce. Um, because, and the Department of, uh, and, and the military, actually, as well. Because the U.S. government, at the same time as we build and support tools that allow us to evade and anonymize our presence, are also allowing U.S. companies and supporting U.S. companies as a marketing venture and are the primary clients of U.S. companies' tools that build the gates that we are then puncturing through the use of U.S. Um, State Department funds. So we're breaking the internet and then we're offering patches. That is the American, taken globally, the American policy right now. What does that mean? Let's just look at numbers. As I said, the Department of State spends between 10 and $25 million a year. The security market for surveillance and censorship technologies is roughly $5 billion a year, right? And that is, the companies out of Silicon Valley and elsewhere, both the U.S. and also a lot in Western Europe, some out of South Africa, some out of Israel, who are designing the technology and have been um, building both for the Americans and for Western Europeans and also for the, com the countries that are practicing the censorship and surveillance of their citizens. Those technologies are built here and sold there, right? So when we're talking about internet freedom policy, we're also talking about a market that we're building and then, and then kind of benefiting from. Very explicitly, we can talk about the companies that do that, right? We can talk about Cisco, we can talk about Naris, which is owned by Boeing, we can talk about Blue Coat, and we know where their technologies go. Cisco, since 2001, has been building the Great Firewall of China. We know that very well. Naris, Blue Coat, other, um, Amasis, which is a, a tool built by, built by the French government, sorry, built by the French, were all deeply embedded in the censorship and surveillance practices of most of the Middle Eastern countries who were our nominal allies prior to the Arab uprising. Tunisia and also Libya, by the way. Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Syria were all using technologies that were created here and sold there. So when we talk about this policy as an agenda, we have to recognize that the, the practices that we have at present are almost incoherent. Now, that is not to say that the State Department is wrong, because I don't believe that. What I believe is that the American government, governmental system is built to be contentious in some ways. And 
even though within state you'll find people who are very passionate advocates for this kind of work. They are not necessarily the same people who are having a, who have and run a larger agenda that are that lives in other departments. But this essential paradigm that we have right now, whereby our our, our security forces, the FBI, our military, and then directed through Treasury and State, um, think of these tools and technologies as whereby we are the primary customer rather than the regulator of them is the paradigm that I think needs to change if we are actually to take this concept of internet freedom seriously. Um, and there are many things that we could do from a policy perspective that could make that happen tomorrow. It's not conceptually difficult to do that. It's conceptually, it's politically difficult to do that and it's a threat to the very deep pockets of the many companies who are building these technologies and also to the embedded lobbying uh, of our of our various um, you know, corporations and their relationships that they have with members of Congress. So this is our scenario today. Um, I'll give you just a, one or two more points and then um, about how one might do that and also just a, a, a thought about how this affects people around the world. So personally, I accept it as a given that the Internet Freedom Policy Agenda exists to support U.S. governmental geopolitical interests. It's not there solely to support the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, regardless of where you might be in the world. And what that means in practice is that the degree of criticism, the, 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 the amount to which we are vocal about whether there is suppression of voice in China or Iran or Syria is not equivalent to the degree to which we are able to speak about Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or the United Arab Emirates. In other words, those that we designate as enemies versus those whom we designate as friends. Now, it is the case that the Saudis are not an open and free government. You know, the, the, the Saudis have less freedom than the Syrians, theoretically. But there are other larger geopolitical factors that come into play, and we recognize that. So what that means from a starting point is that when we talk about internet freedom policy agenda, we are not talking about a universally applied set of norms. We are talking about a US government lens. In other words, the rhetoric of freedom is there to serve a larger agenda. That's neither good nor bad. We're very used, used to the concept of rhetorical gestures and rhetorical movements as part of a diplomatic process. But if you are an activist who, are, who is living in Bahrain or is living in Saudi Arabia, or in the UAE, you cannot expect the same degree of support for your efforts from the US as if you were living in Syria or China. And what this tells individuals around the world who are seeking to use the tools and seeking a relationship or an engagement on an equal footing with the Americans is that your freedom, as it were, as an individual under all of the um, relevant UN and other international organization rules, policies, etc., treaties, etc., is not equivalent. It is not congruent. So returning to the original point. There are things that we could do in that regard. Um, I'm afraid that from a policy perspective, it's mm -hmm. unlikely that the freedom, freedom agenda will ever trump the security agenda or not anytime soon in this country. Um, <coughs> if you think about what the FBI wants to do right now, in terms of internal surveillance in this country, their primary agenda right now is the capacity to have real-time access to Gmail. They want to be able to read your data as it's happening. You have you've probably are familiar with the national security letters, the protocol over the NSA, which has just been ruled unconstitutional, of which some 10,000 NSL letters, more than that perhaps, I think tens of thousands letters of letters have been sent. So these, these are warrantless wiretapping letters, basically, that allow the NSA to have access to um, telecommunications when one of the recipients is outside of the United States. Um, and when you receive an NSL letter, you are not allowed, as a company, you're not allowed to acknowledge that you have even received it. So there's a whole kind of opacity within our legal processes at present that are tied to the Patriot Act and um, the hypothetical CISPA Act, which is there to also, which also support this kind of thing. And, the FISA amendments, which um, 
of 2008, I believe, which also support this kind of action. Um, so we have, on the, legal, on the legal processes side, an opacity that allows us to even know, as individuals within this country, when we're being observed and surveilled. And that behavior internally at home is reflected as well abroad. And people outside of the US are seeing this kind of behavior and knowing that we are accepting it and condoning it. And so I think, as within the State Department, we recognize that openness begins at home. I think the same is true for the larger, larger internet policy agenda. And that for us as American citizens who are, those of you who are, this is an issue which is not insignificant. I must say it's a very bleak picture. I mean, your basic, it sounds almost like we haven't, as a country, improved since the Cold War when we went around the world supporting all manner of dictators because that was, they were our allies. We haven't. Yeah. Well, we won the Cold War. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why would we change? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I mean, I just think that I it's, mean, we it's, also export all kinds of economic policies that we don't practice at home as well. So, well, that's right. Yeah. We don't. Um, but I think it's imp it's very important when you study mm -hmm. diplomatic language to apply a critical lens to it. So, yeah. you don't take a, a speech like Clinton's documents on on mm -hmm. um, on the internet freedom policy and read them with an uncritical eye. You read them in the context, the historical context, and the relation the relational aspect to which they exist in the world. So. Again, I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that state is wrong or the U.S. government is wrong to be doing this. I'm simply saying pay attention to the language and the context in which it is created. The, the long-term solution for this, so there's mm -hmm. a couple of things that we could do. End unaccountable surveillance in the U.S., lead by example, right? Mm -hmm. Very important. Patriot Act reform, Electronic Communications Act 1996 reform, FISA amendments, get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Secondarily, a question of dual-use techno information technologies in their export, and this has to do with commerce and treasury and who we, allow, who we allow U.S. companies to sell these kinds of technologies to. And there is precedent for restriction of dual-use technology in the nuclear field and in um, U.S. Foreign Corrupt, uh, corrupt, corrupt Acts FCPA. Practice Practices Act. Act. Yeah. Practices Thank you. Act, yeah. And uh, a, simple, a simple policy could be a know your customer policy. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in this topic, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has an awful lot on the topic written. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of resources and research you can do on your own. Um, but that would be a simple model in which if you are selling to the Saudi government, for instance, you mm -hmm. are required to do your due diligence to discover the purposes to which the technology will be put before you sell it. And it's very possible to build in a feedback mechanism that tells you who is actually owning and using it. So Blue Coat, for instance, had a, um, Blue Coat is the company that sold mm -hmm. the Syrians the technology that they used to surveil um, their own people and then, then arrested, detained, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Blue Coat knew or could know that, the, that, that by virtue of the fact that their technology was pinging, pinging them back at home where, those, where, that, where the, that software was sitting and they could simply be required to track that data. And that would be a useful and not difficult tool, but however, but it is not something that I think for obvious reasons, US companies who are invested in the security slash technology slash cyber world want to see. Long-term solution for this is the same as um, every other problem the Americans have, which is campaign finance reform. Right. <laughs> Larry Lessing. That's right. That's the end of my talk. That's really interesting. One question. And I'll talk to I'll talk about global voices later okay. if you guys want me to. No, no, that was really interesting. And one question I have for all of you, and of, of course I was also thinking campaign finance reform is when the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act got started, uh, U.S. businesses made the same excuse that they always make when they don't want to change, which is, well, we'll be fighting with one hand tied behind our back. All those other countries are paying bribes, how can you, you know, do this to us? And I guess my question to you is, is this really, and anybody who wants can answer it, is this a different situation because we have such a huge monopoly on the technology that there is a sort of crossroads moment where we could actually change, sort of serve as a role model for the world and make a difference? Or in fact, are the Chinese, the Israelis, the South Africans, or whoever going to go ahead with these sort of nefarious things and get into the market 
it mm -hmm. um, if we're not there? I don't know who wants, who has thought about that or wants to answer I, that question. I have about it. Great, um, I'm sure. I'll start and then. Please. Please. Yeah, and then Richard. Yeah, so absolutely, yeah. it's the case. I think in the context yeah. of the Europeans, it would be possible, and it already is possible, especially the British, to mm. build a coherent um, kind of coalition of people who agree on this idea. Yeah. Um, you know, the cat's a little bit out of the bag with the Chinese because mm -hmm. they learned from us. Yeah. And but now that they know how to do it, it's going to be hard to put stop away from mm -hmm. from building these technologies. The same is true with the South Africans, maybe less so with the Israelis. Mm -hmm. um, but a larger question, long term, is mm -hmm. um, how does this act? How does this kind of exist within the broader set of pol regulatory policies on mm -hmm. trade and commerce? And is this and what side of the issue will trade and commerce in our from our mm -hmm. side? Be on this issue. Are we there as a regulator, or are we there as a promoter? You know, and that is the guess. same question that we've had with commerce for a long time. Are we right. selling milk, or are we regulating milk? Are we selling sugar? Are we, mm. you know, pick your product, right? So, I'll stop there. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the very kind of top level thinking is that this is, you know, goes way back. I mean, uh, you know, think of Alfred Nobel. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, explosives can be used to for destruction or for, you know, building tunnels, which is creation. And, uh, you know, th this tension always exists and it will continue to exist. And, and the, how do you thread the needle on it is, you know, it's a thorny challenge. And I, I think, you know, being aware of it is the first, and acknowledging it is the first step, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Just go ahead, Taylor. Did you want to weigh in on no this? Problem. Oh, okay. Then I was just going to say that um, because I'm teaching this class right now on communication and social change, I've been looking at so many examples from all around the world of when do campaigns suddenly take off. And I know a lot of our students have read the Joe Becker book that looks at landmines or domestic abuse or um, the Kwame Anthony Apia book that compares how did dueling end or foot binding end. So I think that whole question of why, of what suddenly makes people outraged enough to put a stop to something. Um, and I almost wonder, Ivan, if in a way, I'm just thinking out loud here, that I don't know if there's a contradiction in the global voices thinking or how to reconcile this, because I hear in a way you're taking a, you know, a standard good left line that I share on corporate fi on, you know, campaign finance and the economic motivations that cause these problems and a very econ bleak economic, there's incentives, that's it, trade, commerce, they always behave this way, what can you do? With the very, with the very sort of idealistic Rebecca McKinnon Global Voices stance, which mm -hmm. is if we can get sort of netizens motivated and get people out there, we can kind of retake some of the, some of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I've just finished Bob McChesney's new book, which is so, so bleak and really puts those economic interests uh, paramount. Again, I don't know if Taylor or Ivan or either of you want to further unpack that question. I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll, you know. I'll just really quickly say that yeah. I think Rebecca would agree with everything I just said. Oh, I'm sure she would. So. No, of course. But how do you, are, are you guys sort of saying it's got to be both? What I'm, saying, these things are what related? I'm saying in general is yeah. that we shouldn't assume that our freedoms are there for us. Like, if you want mm -hmm. them, you got to fight for them, right? yeah. and and continually so. The the internet, the hypothetical idealistic yeah. internet, to the degree it ever existed, right? Um, you know, is is something that we could lose. Yeah. And um and it comes down to our practices, right? Yeah. Do we choose to spend all of our time on Facebook and mm -hmm. giving away our data, or mm -hmm. do we build our own blogs? Mm -hmm. control our own data and build our own networks as individuals. I mean, these are our own practices. The internet mm. is one of the, is an amazing technology because we actually do have the ability to choose its structure. It's based on what we write, right? Mm -hmm. It's, Facebook is popular because we use it. It's not popular because anyone's telling us to. It's the Aldous Huxley model. You know, give people enough freedom and they build their own walls. See, so, I, th I think I'm heartened because you're saying there's still hope. Absolutely, but it's, <laughs> but, I mean, Rebecca's position and mine are pretty similar, which is, that, which is that our own practices, our own behaviors in, in, in the tools we choose to use, mm -hmm. I think Richard's yeah. example is, very, is a great one, yeah. will, you know, it's not a determined relationship at all. It's not, like, it's not a technology determinism question. It's a, it's a question of what we choose. Of governance, oh. yeah, that's right. Okay, I'm so sorry that, about your no, throat. No, no, no. That, <laughs> sorry, I have almost no voice, so I'm gonna rely heavily on amplification.
Um, but that builds up total, that sets up exactly what I want to talk about, which is to step back a bit and look at the role of the state. Sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> the role of the state in all of this and how hard it is for the state to act in an online networked environment, given the attributes of that online network environment. Um, so, I mean, just a couple of, and you asked for examples, a couple of brief examples of, I think exemplify just how hard that is. So, a year and a half ago, the FBI, along with five or six other intelligence organizations in the Western world, set up a task force to try and figure out how to come to terms with anonymous and with anonymous attacks. <clears throat> They held their first conference call on secured lines, and two days later, Anonymous released the audio tape of their first conference call. Right. So like, problematic, right? How do you stop this in an organization? Um, another one that, that, um, that Richard mentioned. So some of the funding from State Department is going to a project that looks to rightly explore innovative encryption and censorship um, uh, anonymizing tools um, for activists in countries where they're being surveilled. Um, right around the same time this was being developed, um, the FBI put out a, a report or brief on the use of mesh networks and Tor networks and called them both indicators of potential terrorist activity. So again, this, this conflict between mechanisms and the aims of those mechanisms. Um, Blue Coat, which Ivan mentioned. So Citizen Lab last year releases a report on the company Blue Coat, which um, shows how they're being used in 51 human rights suppressing countries, and in particular in Syria, right? So we've heard about that case. Um, but they're not on, the export isn't only allowed by Western countries. Those technologies are used by Western companies, countries. So government ministries um, use them to do basic surveillance on, and control of how the internet's used by, um, by their employees. Companies use them as well. So the dual use technology problem is a real challenge, right? So it's, it's, it's more complicated than just exporting guns to other countries and trying to track where the guns come because these things are really used in a domestic peaceful setting. Peaceful setting, um, we can debate that, but um, the, the dual use is, is really radical in a conflict setting versus in a domestic setting. And what you're getting is this type of surveillance arms race that's happening in Syria and that we've seen in Syria, where government policy is um, supporting activities through projects like Commotion Wireless to help people um, uh, act anonymously and communicate anonymously against the software that is being developed in their own countries. So it's a real, there's a real challenge there. The fourth example I wanted to mention is the, the emerging discourse around internet governance. So right now at the UN, we have this, the Internet Governance Treaty, which one of the things they're trying to regulate is the domain name systems. And you have all sorts of actors in the UN arguing for different types of global control and regulation over the domain name system. But in all the cases, whether it be the Americans or the Russians, or whoever the alliances are who are, who are arguing for different models, in all cases, it's states inside a state-based institution debating how a network that's largely used by and controlled by individuals will be governed. And this creates a real tension when those individuals aren't necessarily a part of this dialogue. Um, one example of where this could go, and I've been talking about, I think, there being one um, uh, ideal version of the internet is one I think we have to really think seriously about if that's the course that's going to emerge out of this. So one example is in response to this discussion of regulating the domain name system um, model is a group in, in Switzerland that said, okay, well, we're going to build a new domain name system. It's called the Open um, Decentralized Domain Name System. And um, the guy who's the lead developer on it said, we're doing this to show governments that it's not possible to prevent people from talking, right? So you could just get this fragmentation of the singular ideal of the internet on which we're having all of these conversations. And that's a very real possibility. And it could, it could be actualized, not just by countries like Russia and Iran who are trying to build their own internets, but by activists who want to create a different version of an internet that in response to some of the actions of Western states to regulate and control the one that they currently operate on. Mm -hmm. So that's a real tension. So 
This is just four examples. There's hundreds of these, obviously, right? Because this space is really challenging. Um, but I think these have real implications for how we talk about a state as an institution, as a construct, engaging in this, in this networked environment. So I just want to point out three. Um, one is I think it points to a real paradox for the state, um, and really for traditional hierarchical institutions more generally, in that the very attributes that determine success in a networked environment, so they, can be they could be borderless, they could be decentralized, they could be self-governed, they could be social, they could thrive on information abundance, they could thrive on anonymity and allow for anonymity. Um, these features that determine success are exactly the features that hierarchical institutions were designed to dissuade. That's why we have these institutions. And that's why they're developed in the, in the 20th century, was to dissuade many of these behaviors. Um, and so, so this isn't, this isn't just a challenge for the state, it's a challenge for corporations and for large non-government organizations and all these other hierarchical institutions. The problem is, is the state can't go away. The state can't creatively destruct. So if GM doesn't evolve its business model to a new sort of networked economy, it can go away and it's act, it, sure. the, it, it should or could or whatever, right? But, but the State Department can't go away. The state market is going to continue to exist as part of a state infrastructure. So that puts the, the I think it creates a poignant challenge for government industries um, over and above other sectors that have in the past relied on the same hierarchical institutional model. The second challenge, I think, for states is, is the one that Ivan made really clear, is that the attempt to shut down what you do, what, or to stop or curtail what you see as deviant behavior in an online network necessarily means you'll shut down what you think is positive behavior, because they both use the exact same mechanisms and tools and networks. So what you do to shut down anonymous will also harm what Global Voices does, because they use the same model and the same network. And that's a real challenge for foreign policies. Because that's not the case with something like physical warfare or the traditional balances of power. The, the final piece is if our international institutions like the UN or like the NDP or like World Bank are all based on this state-based model that don't incorporate and don't fit well in this new international ecosystem, what do the new international institutions look like? So if we're building new international institutions that reflect this reality, who are the actors that are involved and um, what do they look like and what models do we use? Um, and so a, a key to this is that there, there are things that hierarchical institutions do really well. So they, they're really accountable. They can, they can allow for systems of the rule of law to engage with them. They can be part of a democratic system. And I think one of the roles of the state or Western democratic states should be how do you ensure that those values on which their institutions are built be pursued within the new international institutions that I think are going to start to emerge around these new actors who have power, increasingly have power. And I think we've only just started the process of imagining what those institutions might be. And it's, it's really hard to think through. Like, what does an institution, so if the UN was created because um, around states, because at the time it was states that had power, who are the actors that have power now that we need to be a part of this international system? And I think it would have to include groups like Anonymous. It would have to include broad networks like Global Voices. Would, and so are we even in a place when we, could, we can start to have those conversations? And one of the ways in, I think, is to look at the forms of behavior in this online networked environment that we might think are positive for, for creating these new institutions. So what forms of online communication have been really successful? What forms of action? What forms of organization? What forms of collective behavior? So here are things like um, the Pirate Party um, in Europe has been really good at thinking that through, right? Like how do we move these online collective behavioral models into a more systematized model um, in a democratic system? And I think these are the kind of questions these are the kind of questions we need to explore in the um, international model. Um, but I think I'll just leave it there. I have more to say on what was said before, but we can have that in a conversation. Okay. Did either of you want to respond? 
Just, I, I totally agree with everything you just said. Oh, I sort of <laughs> knew this was going to happen. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I mean just, uh, the big picture, I think, is you know, the idea of Walt Gardens, whether it's AOL or Facebook or a country, I mean, are inherently flawed. And so I, that's my hope comes from the fact that, uh, you know, when given the option between being part of a, a flawed, bigger, open mm -hmm. network or, you know, a smaller, controlled network, people tend to opt for the bigger one. Yeah, I hope so. Oh, so just a real quick comment. I mean, I think, I think it's to say what you've just said is not to deny a place for specialization. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in this, in this conversation, we kind of wander very quickly into overheated or determined rhetoric like, okay, if you believe that, that the Internet as a, as a system mm -hmm. um, fosters, is built to, as a tool to do some things better than mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. That means that you always believe that open is good and closed is bad, or you know, general is good and specialized is bad, or hierarchy is bad and, and even is good. And I think that that is not a helpful way of thinking about this. It's not a, it's not a polarized um, kind of conceptual, conceptual model that we're dealing with. And so often this conversation very quickly turns into that, especially in the mass media. And I think th those kinds of discussions are not useful because one thing that you find as you build these kinds of networks and these questions about mm -hmm. governance and how, how large groups of people, you, know, you still have, one thing that's not elastic in this space is people mm -hmm. in your time. And people still need to develop specializations and they're still highly targeted skills. And, and I think that we will continue to, to kind of divide and move in that way. And so to say that an open network exists is not to say that, you know, I'm gonna be sitting in my pajamas for the rest of my life just writing pearls of wisdom as a blogger. That's a very different thing, right? Sorry, no, go ahead. I hate to ask you to say something. No, no, go ahead. No, 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 I was handing you the mic. No, no, I, 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 OK, yeah. good. D should we, what about the audience? Mm -hmm. All you may have some comments or thoughts. Yes, I thought, I, was, I didn't want to call on you as a colleague, but I did want to call on you. So thank you very much, Professor Wachowski. Um, thank you for speaking here today. It's a big treat for me because Richard Bowley was my first um, mentor and employer in the State Department, and I still work in the State Department, as well as teaching here on e-government and digital diplomacy. And in fact, today we had a discussion in class about this idea um, about credibility. And you had said earlier, I didn't know, it was unlikely that the freedom agenda would ever trump the security agenda. And I think one of the great challenges we have for those of us working in government is not, um, it, it, it's not to figure out how the freedom agenda should trump the security agenda, it's how to make people aware that the two are inextricably linked. That if you have um, a, a government that's considered not credible, because it's not promoting freedom, it's not putting its money where it's not, it's, where its policies aren't in keeping with its values, that it's a, it is a security risk. And so people like Richard and other like dedicated people in government, I think, work to try to help make that awareness more palpable mm -hmm. and make that more um, of an issue on the forefront. Mm -hmm. But we're working from this internal perspective of just kind of how government operates. I'm wondering if the two of you can make comments about, um, perhaps from an outside perspective, what people within government can do mm -hmm. to help promote this. Absolutely. Yeah, and I sympathize with that. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not here to you know knock people over the head, um, because I, know, I recognize how hard it is. Um, so when I put that, when I create a, a dichotomy there, it's in part because this is the way the issue is viewed by many, many people around the world, and it's important. It's important when you when you encounter that kind of attitude from somebody who's not inside of your system. Um, if your response is to say, no, you just don't understand, then um, what you often find is a ba an even stronger backlash. And, and I'm not suggesting that you're saying that. I'm telling you what people's perspective is, right? right? So I just wanted to clarify that I mean making people within government, okay. our own government, aware of that. So, yeah. so one thing I would say is when, when somebody doubts your, your good intentions or your... Um, what you feel as, as, a, as a government representative, any government representative, um, 
from an, a kind of an honest and earnest perspective, is that that doubt is probably coming from a very real place, that is a mistrust of governance. And for instance, think about Pakistan's relationship to um, the U.S. Why does, why does Pakistan, why do Pakistani citizens distrust the United States government so much? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I think a, a really overlooked reason is that most Pakistani citizens really distrust their own government. And, and I, I've spent a lot of time in Pakistan. I have a lot of Pakistani friends, I, you know, and there's a lot of really intelligent, really talented people in Pakistan who find themselves in a context of saying, my government is run a, as a patronage network, and everybody who has power gets it because of a, pat a patronage network. And the Pakistani govern government is, you know, the U.S. government is a, it's a patronage network. And so if that's their relationship, they must be bad too. And maybe they're right, maybe they're not, but that's the perspective that they're coming from. And so when, people, when, when you hear those kinds of distrust perspectives that, that, don't, that don't make sense to you, you kind of have to say, okay, what does it look like from where you're standing? What does that power look like from where you're standing? Um, essentially, a, a really simple thing from the perspective of e-diplomacy has to do with the ownership of platforms. So when you are, as an organization, saying we're going to build a platform and people can come and talk on it, the fact that you own it, that you have the servers, that you're setting the agenda, that it's your design, that it's your convert, you're, 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 you're setting the overall mood and setting in which the conversation will take place, is an expression of power. So one way to get around that is to say, I'm not going to, we're actually not going to have this conversation on the U.S. government platform, I'm going, to, I'm going to reach out to you where you are, and I'm going to come to you, to you in your space. Because people are, I mean, from a UI perspective, from a design perspective, from a linguistic perspective, people are, are very aware of um, who is owning and controlling the dialogue space in which they're, they're working. So those are just two ideas. Yeah, just a couple things. When I... It seems to me that we have to be so aware of the, the different interests of different government departments in this. So you go to an e-diplomacy conference with State Department people and foreign ministry people and development ministry people, and that's one particular conversation. And there definitely, there's a lot of conservative, small c conservative views in that world, but there's also a lot of really progressive ones, and there always has been. You go to a military cybersecurity conference, and it's an entirely different world. Mm -hmm. And there the conversation is about control. Mm -hmm. And it, it is about defending the homeland against security threats and doing and controlling the system on which those threats emerge. And those might be incongruous. Those, it might be that they're, they're totally incompatible. And that's something I think we need to flesh out, right? Because it right. matters to this broader global conversation. conversation. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested to hear from those of you in government how one starts to craft a coherent policy. What level of government does that have to sit? Is it in the White House? Is it in, where, where does that conversation take place? How do you negotiate between commerce and state over OFAC, for instance? How does that happen? What's the mechanism? Well, I think there's a lot of fight. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's not a negotiation, maybe right? it's a brawl. Yeah, well, I know. and a lot of leaking. They also can happen discreetly, of, right? They yeah. don't, there doesn't need to be coordination. Yeah. So I think it's fascinating yeah. that the, the whole e-diplomacy discourse and state emerged post 9-11 in parallel with this mm -hmm. broad securitization of all sorts of other policy areas. Yeah, yeah. So these things can happen in parallel, yeah. but I think we need to be wary of how one counterbalances the other and how they work together. Great. Offered models of practice as perhaps offering some differences, that is, the, 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 the debate between e diplomacy and cybersecurity, there might be less securitization. Uh, and uh, that whether that was the world of best practice. Uh, and, and so I, I was wondering if you could reflect on that. Yeah. Yeah, you guys give just a little bit, just a teeny mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I mean, this is a you know anecdote, I guess, a, you know, experience, um, very small, but uh, you know, soon after 9/11, I worked with in the office that deals with our relate manages our relations with the European Union, and um, we had a 
you know, a, a thorny issue around passenger name record access. Um, you know, we, our policy, it, it's, it's really interesting to kind of think of the difference of how we think about our relationships of who we trust. I mean, trust is a key part of this. So in the U.S., you know, by default, what we have done is, what we kind of said is we trust businesses, we don't trust government, right? So mm -hmm. data aggreg aggregation can be done by companies and they can create a virtual you and sell products to you and create, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sell that to other third parties, et cetera. Uh, you know, government to get that same information has to, you know, I would have to go through a judge to be able to, to gain access to it, even though as a private citizen, I can pay $198 and get access mm -hmm. to it. So uh, in, in, in Europe, it's just the opposite. In Europe, they trust government, but don't trust the data privacy directive says you mm -hmm. can't, if you as a company collect information, you can't, um, mm -hmm. you know, you can only use it for the purpose for which it was collected. When that purpose ends, you need to, you know, eliminate it. So that became a, a challenge around passenger uh, name record access, which was being used to screen passenger for potential terrorists. The interesting part for me was when, um, so, so the European approach is this kind of uh, very structured approach where you have data privacy directives, or they're called data privacy czars in each country. And very, you know, powerful position. Um, but frankly, you know, I, I remember when the information first came out that an air, air carrier had submitted information um, for analysis to the U.S. government. Uh, you know, the data privacy, you know, the, the, the czar in the EU and some of the specific countries said, we're going to begin a process of reviewing this and, you know, we're, we're not happy with it. Um, the ACLU sued the next day. Mm -hmm. And the question was, which is more effective? I mean, you have this, you know, private actors or, in, you know, these parallel institutions meant to, uh, to be able to, you know, kind of hold each other in check. I mean, I don't know. It, I thought it was pretty interesting that the quick reaction happened in our system, which really doesn't have the formal structure, and the kind of ponderous, slow process in the EU, which took, you know, months and months and months before anything happened, um, you know, was yeah. held up yeah. as being more powerful. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Europeans, the Europeans aren't, aren't uh, united on this topic either. So, uh, and one way, one area where the differences also really play out are, are in international uh, intellectual property. But that's a whole another conversation I suspect we're probably not going to get into tonight. So I'm not going to go there just to note that there's a whole space there. Um, but if you look at the, the practices of Sweden, England, France, and Italy, for instance, you see right there, there are four very different ways of interpreting these questions. You know, the Italians have already mandated a certain kind of intermediary, intermediary liability. And, uh, you know, Google, mm -hmm. some Google executives can't go to Italy without yeah. getting arrested at this point, hypothetically. Um, the British are a little bit closer to the U.S. system. The Swedes um, are, and, the, and, and Iceland are extremely kind of pro uh, pro privacy, pro anonymity, um, user user protections are very strong. Uh, the French are something else again. They're much more interested in. They kind of have a almost a corporatist structure. I think I, I put, I'd say, um, in which individuals actually kind of are less important, even though there's a, there is a privacy aspect. And then the Germans are very very strong on data protection and privacy. Um, you know, you can't you go to Germany and there's no such thing as an open Wi-Fi network. Because if you have an open Wi-Fi network and somebody is searching, using, using it to look for pornography or look at Nazi literature, then the person who owns the network is liable. And so there's no open networks in Germany in that way. And uh, there's a whole range of privacy issues that predate the internet that have basically built the legal infrastructure for how the Germans deal with privacy. It has to do with... Uh, Purging, purging not you know, German Germany's laws from the vestiges of fascism. Um, and so, you know, such as one final example in that context. In in Germany, you can't take a picture on the street of an individual of less than ten people and publish that picture. You have to get their right. You have to get permission because it's a privacy issue. People own their image in in that context. So, it's a lot of variation in the, in the European context as well. I uh, it was a question uh, not just of the security privacy, but also the cybersecurity military dimension, which I'm not sure how it 
which inflects you know, the EU you know. policy and, and whether that be became a, 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 a con condition in development in Europe of so EU diplomacy. So mm -hmm. very wonderful. The, the privacy question, how that would, but then also the, that dimension of cyber security as a military dimension. I, I just wouldn't, I, the only thing I would say is when you listen to NATO conversations about cybersecurity, there's a fair amount of consistency among NATO members. It isn't, there isn't significant, there aren't significant that I know of divides within NATO about some of these things. So if we're talking about Western Europe and North America, the military approach to the cyber domain and even calling it a domain is relatively consistent. I suspect so, yes. Yeah. And I mean, just to tie this out, one more thing, to tie the cybersecurity conversation to the, to the domestic privacy and information one, this space is moving so fast. I mean, even if you, like, the cybersecurity one is monthly, there's new information about both offensive and defensive operations by the American military and NATO forces, right? So that's a, that's a constantly evolving thing. On the domestic privacy one, it's, to me, that's the greatest bellwether of how fast this space is moving. I mean, look at, just watch a company like Facebook and how their own perceptions of the data they can get and the data they can use are changing on a quarterly basis. It's remarkable. And they're, of course, care about monetizing it. But um, look at something like Google Glass which up until six months ago, nobody was talking about at all. And I was at a demo of it a couple of months ago, and the privacy considerations around that are incredible. What that's gonna do to the amount of data, live video streaming data that's in the cloud and searchable. Um, so with, with these things rolling out over the next few years are really gonna change this conversation. Do I see Anarelli with a question? I mean, uh one no? last okay. comment in that context. The question, I mean, for U.S. citizens is, to what degree is the U.S. military actually operating and surveilling, you know, U.S. at this point, mm -hmm. you at this point, and especially with a, the larger integration between the military and intelligence agencies? And that's not a small thing, um, but it's very, very hard to have any insight into that at all if you're outside of the U.S. government system, if, you're, if you don't have the proper security clearance. So there's a lot of speculation on the topic, and I'm sure that there are probably some of you in this room who actually know a lot about this and probably can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it makes, there's an, I'll just point to the overall impact of that, which is that, okay, step back for a second. In 2002, I went to a conference in Denmark in, the parla in Parliament. And at the time, um, Parla Dan the Danish Parliament was completely open to the public. Anybody could walk in off the street any time of day, walk into the building, and use it. And there was there's something incredible about that concept, about a government that doesn't need to gate itself off from its own people. Now, I recognize that there are real-world security fears and concerns and so on and so forth, but I think the idea that we should be trying to build a society that seeks that as a, an ideal or as a goal and works to mitigate those walls or those barriers between its people and its government is a good one. And it's the kind of society that I want to live in. So when I see that we've kind of created a system in which people profit from and benefit from building those walls and that they are essentially the same people who run the country, it's, um, and, and I mean that literally because so often congressmen go and work for those companies and generals, ex-generals go and work for those companies then we have to ask ourselves what it is that we've wrought. Well, I have a colleague in my office who's been at the State Department longer than I have, and he said when he started, uh, people would come off the mall 
to go into the State Department to use the bathrooms. So mm -hmm. it wasn't that long ago <laughs> when we actually were that way. <laughs> that is not allowed anymore. No. <laughs> No, great question. And we, we um, you know, so I, I always say that, you know, innovators embrace constraints. And if you're in Silicon Valley, you've got to be faster than the next startup. And if you're in government, you've got to be able to, you know, run through and around and address a lot of hurdles um, that most people, you know, tech startups would pull out their hair or, or quit before they would take on. Uh, so we spend a ton of time working with people in, you know, everything from, you know, records management uh, to, you know, personal identi uh, personally identifiable information, diplomatic security. Uh, I mean, everybody we think could have a dog in the fight or be, you know, unhappy with what we're doing. We bring in before we start designing. We say, here's what we're looking to do. Here are the wireframes. This is the, how, where are your concerns? Um, where can we work together to kind of bake in solutions to what your concerns are from the beginning? And will you work with us to, to make sure that, that we're meeting those needs? So, um, you, know, you, you know, there's a lot of frustration, and that, that's, I think, a big difference oftentimes between the political uh, folks who come in for a short period of time and get really frustrated with rules and people who are career folks and are in uh, for a lifetime um, that, you know, it's hard to build walls, right? So you run into a wall, somebody spent a lot of energy to create that wall. So instead of like sucking your teeth and you know, uh, cursing the wall, understand why it's there and then figure out how you can, um, you know, if, if you got the bandwidth to be able to say this wall doesn't need it anymore, let's see how we can remove it. Or how do we you know, take with the goal that it was trying to achieve and bring it into the kind of 21st century? Um, so we, we do a lot of what, what ends up streamlining um, you know, we streamlining processes and reinterpreting things for a digital age that were written for a paper-based age, uh, and and where we can make a difference, do that. Um, but but we're, you know, we check all the boxes and we try to engage in these, um, you know, conversations that help hopefully improve for the people who follow us how those, uh, you know, laws, regulations, and uh, are being interpreted. I was wondering what your thoughts are around the issues using pseudonyms, and um, I th I'm just linking this to a specific example that's currently in debate in the Mexican agenda for reform and transparency law. There was a specific act that was sort of rendered problematic, this fine line between anonymity and transparency, and it was a commissioner of the Institute for Federal Access to Information that sort of has to promote the use of what here would be the FOIA. Um, and she was using uh, names, um, false names, to solicit information, uh, sort of like a surveillance mechanism for um, academics and um, some, some of our colleagues to, um, that were critics of the last presidents strategy against the, the drug wars. Um, this obviously created sort of a debate around increasing cybersecurity laws, but then what, it, what does it mean to maintain anonymity when it's also sort of going back to the dual use that you were saying it can also be a problem um, against or freedom of speech here is sort of it's essential for it, but um, it can also be used in negative ways to surveil society from the government itself. So I was wondering what, how you think regulation or sort of policy can be a part of how technology is being used or how can technology be part of the policy debate? I mean, I can, I, this is, you know, I've spent a ton of time in Latin America and so we think, I always try to think, squint and think of um, 
kind of historical precedents. And so think of the times in, you know, in Colombia during the drug wars when you had faceless judges. So that was, those were anonymous judges. I mean, that's something that there's a huge argument and debate around that, you know, can you have, can you actually be judged by somebody you can't see? Um, but if the person being seen means that they're going to, they or the family will be killed, how do, you, how do you deal with that? So, you know, there's precedents for kind of thinking about this in the analog world um, that, that may lend some, yeah. some, some thought to, to this area. I mean, if, it's, if somebody's, you know, trying to pretend they're not a government official uh, and, you know, that, you know I, I think there's probably a lot of uh, concerns that that would ri raise and, and, you know, I, I don't know Mexican law, but that there are, you know, maybe questions that, you know, or laws that question that. I mean, that's a power issue, right? Because the question is not, I mean, an anonymous judges is a, a threat, but anonymity is most valuable in the context of protecting the powerless, right? Mm -hmm. you, want, you want to be able, you want to be anonymous when you have a real chance of being targeted just because of who you are, whether your gender, whether your ethnicity or your religion or your, your political beliefs. And, um, and so a, a blanket real name policy, whether it's a government issue or, or a, um, a commercial one can be highly problematic in contexts in which, uh, in which there is no trust or it's not a functioning law or the, the law is broken in some way. I believe, by the way, that there's, the, was it the Koreans who had a, um, a real name policy connected to ISPs a few years ago, is that right? And, the, and after a couple of years of trying to implement it, they found that, that uh, the people that they were targeting were not the reasons that the law was written. They were mostly going after um, people with let, very little power, but who had uh, were in opposition to the government in some form or fashion, rather than um, IP people who were using it for I, IP um, ripoffs, which is, was the ostensible reason for the law. So I think if you're going to create a law that requires some kind of real name policy, you have to. There's both a question of who actually it protects and who it who it renders transparent, and its implementation. I mean, it's vital to make sure that the implementation is actually fair and, and relevant. Yeah, I would just add to that that whether or not there's regulation of it, these are system design issues and community design issues. And if we're increasingly thinking of these as public spaces, then we need to really think through how the design decisions are going to change behavior in them and on them. Mm -hmm. And the more and more government are, are, um, governments are using these spa communities as, public, as real public spaces, then um, their engagement in those regulations are more and more important the, as they intersect with the design decisions. Actually, one, one more thing on that. The, the, we're, the, the, all of this assumes the written named policy, which is assuming a certain kind of behavior on the internet. And more, how do we translate that to the widespread use of facial recognition? And, is putting your picture online, whether you have a name or not, is that now going to be your identifier and be tracked? So that's a whole other element of this conversation. I mean, that's that actually. Um, I mean, I haven't tracked it from back in the day, but the, uh, you know, Endifact kind of used for passport recognition, facial recognition, and, yeah. and digital instead of digital print um, for a number of reasons. But that was you know, ten years ago. They're, they're fairly basic questions, but essentially, Richard, I'm just curious if the Internet Freedom Agenda is something that was so personality driven by Secretary Clinton that it now be or will be it has been institutionalized within the State Department. What's the future um, agenda for it? But also, what has been done to actually create that space and allow global citizens to have access to this technology, to have internet technology, whether it be through American corners or the spaces that public policy programs provide. Um, and then for you, Ivan, I'm just I'm curious, especially the Global Voices Network, when Secretary Clinton delivered these two speeches, what really was kind of the reaction in a lot of these countries that you know are so skeptical of American power and do you see more clearly than maybe the American public does the, the tension between like promoting material strength and then also wanting to kind of lock the liberal goals as well. So. Well, just, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I know that Ivan 
uh, reference the Secretary Clinton's two speeches, um, but I would like to even reference something a little closer. We run a conference called Tech at State. Uh, I would urge you to just, if you don't write anything else down, tech.state.gov. It'll take you to the community that we uh, co-curate each conference with. So we'd love to have you help us think through our, our future conferences. Uh, but you know, under the, you know, under Secretary uh, Kerry, we did the Tech at State Internet Freedom, and uh, you know, our mutual friend uh, and and uh, many others, uh, you know, some great content there, uh, both from the, you know the State Department as well. It, it, you know, it's really not meant to to kind of flack for whatever the formal um, uh, you know kind of party line is, but to really get in a lot of people and, and challenge and have a, you know, hopefully a little edgy conversation rather than, so, so I think it's alive and well. Um, you know, act, like all, a lot of policy, it depends on facts on the ground, what's happening around the world, how much emphasis it gets, and what's competing for bandwidth with other, other challenges and issues. So that's kind of hard to predict, but, uh, you know, it's a, a, certainly a critical part of, uh, of our work and the work of uh, many of our partner offices in the State Department. Noting, by the way, that um, many of the individual individuals who had been part of the administration in the first term have just left in the last three months who were affiliated with, with that, with the Internet Freedom Agenda. So all, many of the top, the top, uh, top people in that space have moved on. Um, but that's a pretty normal thing within government. The question is who's going to be hired next. Um, I think in general the response to this issue was wariness, um, in part because um, people outside of the U.S. are used to the rhetoric of freedom um, coming from the U.S., but feel as if it's applied unequally. And so there was definitely some hope, but also some concern that special, creating an Internet freedom policy agenda um, as a separate device was also a way of siloing it. So a couple of concerns. One, that it was a way of siloing it when really it should be part of a broader human rights agenda. So there was one strain of thought which said, is it really appropriate to actually create a silo for this topic rather than dealing with a broader set of agenda of rights and policy agendas and, and, and pushing those forward? Um, I'm not going to, you know, that's a long debate, so I'm not going to get into that. But there was definitely a, a set of questions around that. The second set of questions around which countries were going to benefit or not. So will we be treating the Bahrainis the same way that we treat the Iranis? The answer is no, and that's, uh, you know, it's really evident to people very, very quickly. Um, and so it feels like hypocrisy. Um, and I think the, what else would I say about it? Um, the third element was that um, people are wary of being instrumentalized by U.S. foreign policy f towards some end. And so uh, they want to make sure, activists and others want to make sure that they're not being used as a repre or represented as, in, as if they are an active player in a U.S. foreign policy agenda because they don't have any window or vision into why it is that the U.S. is necessarily doing what they're doing. So we know in theory why we support Bahrain. We know that the U.S. Fifth Fleet is there. And, and we know that you know there's all these other issues with Iran and, and sectarian conflict, um, but if you're an individual democracy or activist or organizer in Bahrain and you're being punished because of the gov your attitude towards the government, somehow the U.S. government's position is less clear, I guess. And so, and if you're being named as a representative of that policy, you're wondering, am I being here? Am I here as a symbol? Or am I, am I here because you really have my back? And will you continue to do so? So it's hard because when you put forward an agenda that that's, that's that aggressive, it's really hard from a political perspective to actually back it up all the time. And I sometimes think that maybe um, a, a, more, a more appropriate approach could be maybe to frame the issue more quietly and with less ambition. Mm -hmm. So that you, when you, if you fail to meet those targets, you're not blamed for them. But, but it's not an easy thing, so, you know. And that gets to one of the real, real innovations that Secretary Clinton had, I think, was to allow for experimentation and risk-taking in that, 
in what, was, what is a very mm. conservative culture. And mm -hmm. that's to right. me, that's the big signal. Is, are people still mm -hmm. allowed to do these kinds of projects that have real discernible risk to them? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Were there any last um, questions or closing comments before we wrap up? I'm conscious of the time. Did you? You all sit your piece? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. One last question. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, so this is for Andy. You mentioned one resource you know, for further people, like further interests, and I was wondering if there were any others that any panelists would recommend. I mean, I've put another plug for something that we're working on, and we would love uh, to see, you know, be spread much further than than, than our office uh, or the State Department can do, which are these uh, tech camps, which are really these kind of co bringing technologists and civil society organizations together, and it's smart technologists, technologists who know if you're going to use technology, how you can use it safely, um, and uh, trying to identify low-cost, easy-to-implement technology solutions to problems that emerge during that. So it's a, it's a process we've created. We've, we've kind of bootstrapped every one we've done, and we've done 23 of them around the globe. And we don't have a budget for it. Um, but we would love to, you know, and, the, and again, there's a website for it, techcampglobal.org, all one word, techcampglobal.org. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to see other organizations pick those up. Uh, or if you're, you know, hackers for good that you know who are interested in being part of it, um, you know, so a plug. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no. Any mm -hmm. other plugs? Uh, yeah, I want to put in a plug for IRCs, Internet Chat Rooms. You know, mm -hmm. basically, um, sometimes it's really easy in, to get, uh, to develop a, a fixation or a, a passion for tools and technology and forget community. Mm -hmm. But the hardest thing to do is to organize trusted community over time. And sometimes a simple tool is the best thing. Sometimes. Um, sometimes no tool at all is the best thing. So in, in, in thinking about where we are in this space, it's really important to remember that the tool is there to facilitate human contact, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Yeah. That's my plug. Thank you. I love it. Well, plug sounds mean. The tip. <laughs> I would just make a much more personal plug. That, um, we've just launched a project called the International Relations and Digital Technology Project. Mm. And the website is IRDD irdtp.org and there's a bibliography in it that we've done over the last year which has tried to map and make sense of the literature that brings together the technology world, the IR world, um, and the governance world. And so it's, I hope it's a useful resource to start. In that case, I'll make one more point. Yeah, good. <laughs> good. If we're making personal plugs. Yeah. So um, Global Voices Advocacy is uh, the wing of our organization that fo focuses on rights issues. And, mm -hmm. and um, we have, as a, uh, we have a, a kind of an expanded team in the last couple months. Um, there's a lot, uh, there's a, a weekly report that we produce called the Netizen Report that neat, well, nicely summarizes a lot of the mm -hmm. current issues around all of the topics that we've been discussing this week, um, th 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 today. Mm -hmm. And there's a, an increasing amount of content being on that space, being written by local individuals from seeing the issues that we're talking about from their perspective and their concern. So if you're interested in understanding how the rest of the world is seeing yeah. these issues, it's a good place to go. It's advocacy.globalvoicesonline.org. Oh, good. Well, those sound like really interesting places, so I'm sure many of us will visit. Um, thank you again to our illustrious panelists. This was a really interesting, lively conversation. Also to the Blinken Institute and to um, Catherine Brown and Lily Glenn for organizing this event. Thank you so much for coming, Thanks. everybody. Thank you.